Would you put your life on the line for a washing machine? No? How about a box of bathroom tiles? Second-hand car? A goat. I've just spent a few adrenaline-charged days mixing it with a bunch of young men who do exactly that. They risk their lives time after time, scrambling through makeshift tunnels and smuggling goods from one country to another. It's a bizarre variation of those old escape movies where desperate men burrow their way to freedom against incredible odds. The difference is these tunnel rats always come back, even though their home is the worst kind of prison. We're driving south through the Gaza Strip. The border with Egypt is just ahead. Where the road ends, all we see are piles and piles of dirt and hundreds of tents. The ground beneath is honeycombed with tunnels, Gaza's extraordinary underground economy. They smuggle in refrigerators, flat screen TVs, even cars cut into sections. If it's portable, it gets through. From here, you can see how big this black market has become. That wall over there is Egypt. That's the border, about 500 metres away. And down below, every single one of those white tents covers the entrance to a tunnel. There's roughly 600 of them. A network of holes that one tunneler described to me as being like Swiss cheese under the ground. Why go to so much trouble? Because Gaza is sealed off from the outside world. A tiny Palestinian enclave, 40 kilometres long, being suffocated by an Israeli land and sea blockade. So the only way in is to dig deep beneath the border. Some passages up to a kilometre long. They've become essential but dangerous lifelines under the sand. Have there been many deaths through cave-ins? Uh, around 300. They have been dead in tunnels till now. Th 300 people? Uh, 300 people have died underground here? Yeah. And you want me to go down here with one? <laughs> well, it's your job. It's rare to be allowed here, but one enterprising young guy, Nasser Najir, managed to get us in. The tunnel owners don't want the Israelis to find out who they are, because they often bomb the area to destroy them. What are they doing? They're bringing wood and cement from Egypt right now bringing wood and cement from the other side. Yeah. Ancient generators power the lights, winches, and phone lines as they prepare a big bobsled-like device to haul the goods through. Why do I get that sinking feeling? Now it's my turn to go down. Oh, I fancy doing this for a job. Yeah, it's relatively shallow. The vertical shaft runs down about 10 metres. Then it runs horizontally to Egypt. The first bobsled arrives, and it's loaded with bathroom tiles. All this stuff from Egypt, huh? Yeah, sure. There's no room to stand, and not much air to breathe. The tunnel supports are ominously buckled. Sleep now. Yeah? These tunnels are something of a business in themselves, you see. If you own one, it's worth about $50,000 to you. That's minimum price, although there's a slight catch. If one of your men die in this, in a cave-in, then you pay their family about $40,000. From where I'm sitting at the moment, it's uh, really not worth the money. The tiles are transferred into buckets for the final vertical haul. They'll be in the shop for sale within a few hours. All these tunnels are built with varying degrees of sophistication. This one's wide and high, purpose-built for animals. After being herded through from Egypt, there's an elevator up the long shaft into Gaza. This is Gaza's only source of fresh lamb, and buyers come straight to the tunnels. As we drove away, they were stashing the animals into a taxi. Nearby, another tunnel and another shipment, though a much less sophisticated operation. This one is tiny and terrifying. Herding the startled animals along the narrow passages is specialised work. And here, there's no elevator. It's primitive, but effective all the same. 
The sheer scale of this tunnel economy and the variety of it is simply staggering. I've never seen anything quite like this. This is Gaza's so-called tunnel markets. The tunnels themselves are just down around that corner at the bottom of the street. But here, you name it, you can get it. Generators, TVs, microwave ovens, the odd lawnmower. There's washing machines, radios, some a little bit dusty, but I'm told working perfectly. And if you come just across the road, they're unloading the latest batch from the tunnels right now, courtesy of the horse and cart. Speaking of animals, sheep, I'm told, cows, and on good days, the occasional goat. The tunnels began flourishing after Israel laid siege to Gaza in 2007, when Hamas, a hardline Islamist organization, was elected to control the enclave. Hamas and Israel have been at each other's throats ever since, and the people of Gaza are caught dead in the middle. The United Nations has to plead with Israel on a daily basis to let some humanitarian supplies in by road. Food and medicine is okay, and then anything and everything else has to be negotiated and has to be proven to have a very high humanitarian value. Well, what about things for children like uh, textbooks and toys? Again, all, toys? All, all of these things have to be negotiated. They have to be negotiated. You have to negotiate with the Israelis for textbooks? Yes. The UN's man on the ground, John Ging, says Gazans are getting a fraction of what they need to survive the crisis. What they're getting is not what you would get in an Australian prison, for example, three square meals a day from the UN. Not at all. We're so overwhelmed by this demand, we're giving them just five basic food items, um, which is a subsistence. Would you be better off in an Australian prison? Oh, yes. Yes, because in an Australian prison, first and foremost, your water and sanitation uh, would be much better. It makes for a miserable life for people like Jamila Habash, whose carers have trouble importing spare parts for her artificial legs. It costs time and wasting time because we are in bad need, maybe for Jamila, we need maybe some valve like this. It's a dreadful irony for Jamila. It was an Israeli bomb that blew both her legs off a year ago. And it's the Israelis who hold up shipments of prosthetics for Jamila and other war victims in this Red Cross hospital. It's run by Dr. Hazem Shawa. Look to Jamila. Jamila, just 15 years. She's still young, she's like a flower. She's just starting her life. What they did for her? What is the meaning of this? What is the meaning of this bloody war in Gaza, on Gaza? So you want the border open now for medical supplies? At least this is, this is to be human, Yanni. They must open this. What would you say to Jamila when it takes her three months to get a part for her artificial limbs? I think the real question is to the Hamas. Israel's Why Deputy Foreign Minister, Danny Ayalon, puts the blame squarely the Hamas. on Hamas. We are not in Gaza. They are the owners of Gaza. They have brought the political situation and the humanitarian disaster to the people of Gaza. It's so not because of us. you control the border, but you take no responsibility for the We effect. control the border so long as they continue to smuggle arms and terrorists. If they would stop that, if they would abide by the international norms, then the people of Gaza will not suffer. The only ones who benefit from all this are the tunnel owners. Gaza's nouveau riche, who found a unique way to make money. Here, they're bringing in bags of cotton. And in the dead of night, some tunnels have been used to bring in weapons and explosives. And when the Israelis find out, it triggers a ferocious response. Whenever we know that there is specific uh, shipment of uh, explosives or f weapons, of course we will have to take measures as we do. Many people have died digging and working in those tunnels. Does that concern you? If they are terrorists, no. If they are good people, yes. Good or bad, tunnel owners can make a lot of money. So there are new passages being dug all the time. We found these two teenage boys hard at work. But this tunnel looked dodgy, to say the least. 
no supports, and the electrics dangerously exposed. Do people ever run into each other underground? Uh, sometimes they do. And this is a very big problem that uh, causes death. Uh, whenever there's two tunnels, they're under each other or beside each other. They, they might be weaker. But they risk deadly cave-ins to meet the enormous demand, especially for building materials. Israel's blockade includes a ban on all construction supplies being brought in across the border, despite its planes obliterating much of Gaza last year. I have no cement or steel or iron. We can't get in one bag of cement, one pane of glass, 10 months later to actually begin that reconstruction. But if the average Gazan wants to rebuild their lives, rebuild their homes, you can't blame them for using the tunnels, can you? No, I mean, people are struggling, uh, are struggling just to survive. We don't condone the using of the tunnels. So you, the United Nations, will not use the tunnels? No, we will not use the tunnels. We demand that the legitimate crossing points be opened up because we need to create an alternative to the black market economy, the legitimate economy. So it's no wonder the smugglers are thriving. They have a virtual monopoly. It's extraordinary when you think about it. Everything coming into the strip travels through a hole in the ground. It's the only way or, that people can bring goods into Gaza. So uh, there's no other way because uh, the Israeli borders are closed, the Egyptian border is closed. It's the only way. Hello, I'm Amelia Adams. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for our brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minute segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on ninenow.com.au and the Nine Now app.